We welcome you to another episode of Learning Stories. This is a show where we interview a diverse set of learners from the 21st century. In each episode of this show, we profile a guest who has a story to share about how they acquired a set of skills and knowledge in a creative and innovative manner. In the process, we hope to uncover a new definition of learning as conceptualized, narrated, and imagined by the guest in our show. Uh, today's guest is uh, Shivani Gorle, who um, I've known for quite some time now. I, we were just chatting about this maybe over eight years. Um, we were actually in the same program um, at an undergraduate university in Mumbai. Um, and uh, we were pursuing a mass media course. And uh, I've always uh, looked up to Shivani as someone who is, um, who's really inspiring with the way she expresses herself um, on different platforms. Just to give you a little background about Shivani's work professionally, um, Shivani is a cultural strategist who's interested in how businesses tap into the zeitgeist to bring us together and influence our brand choices in a digital age. She began her career in design as the first ever cultural strategist at Thought Matter, which was an award-winning strategic design and branding studio where she built identities for purpose-driven brands, planned creative campaigns, and wrote articles about emerging cultural trends. She was also a teaching assistant and facilitator for the Trends in Culture Analysis, Insight and Forecasting course at the School of Visual Arts in New York. She holds an MA in Communication and Journalism and a Bachelor of Mass Media from the University of Mumbai. Um, and she also has a Master's in Branding from the School of Visual Arts, um, where she also got the Brand Master Award for Exceptional Academic Achievement. In addition to um, her work in uh, the space of branding, um, she was also uh, part of a project actually the creator of a project called uh, Queens on Screen, um, which we can speak about more in this uh, particular podcast. And I'm really excited to chat about that. Um, Shivani grew up in India and uh, she went to a wonderful school called uh, Vishwashanti Gurukul. Um, I'm sure, I think it was an IB school. Was it Shivani? Yeah. An IB school. So um, there's, there's a lot to chat about. Uh, Shivani has been like, all over the place and she's done so many different interesting things. Um, but Shivani, what was it like to listen to yourself being talked about in third person? <laughs> Abhishek is good at hyping people up as always. Um, thank you for listing all my three degrees and the longest course name <laughs> as part of a grad school in existence. I know that's a tough one. So thank you for nailing that. Uh, I... <laughs> I was actually thinking about that as soon as I read it out. I'm like, that is a very long course name. Yeah, it's a, it's a very long bio and, and, and a lot of hyping up coming from someone who wrote a book by the time we were already in grad school. Uh, so, um, you. We, wrote that. We, we have our own accolades to speak of. If I could do a bio of you right now, it would be even longer, I'm sure. So. Well, you know what's funny, Shivani? I still have, um, like, just, you know, random memories. I remember you had given me a copy of the of a book by Ernest Hemingway, The Old Man in the Sea. I, I still, I know, I still have a copy of that book. I think it was back in the day. And uh, I think that was one of the books that really stayed with me. For some reason, it really, you know, some books really stay with you at certain points in your life. I think I really needed to read that at that point. And for some reason, I just thought about that as soon as you said the word book. And it's, yeah, I, I don't know. Does that happen to you sometimes when you read a certain book at a certain point in your life and you read the same book again, like five years down the line and you feel like it's a completely different book? You're reading it anew because you're bringing a new person to the reading experience. I, I definitely have felt that. I think certain books have defined entire periods of my life, kind of like the way we relate with music, right? Like music or certain smells always bring us back to a time in our life it, it has a nostalgic power and I feel like books can do the same but in my life I think there's if there's one book that truly completely appended everything I knew to be true was The Fountainhead by Ayn Rand mm -hmm. um, 
I had the misfortune of reading that book when I was 15 and very impressionable. Uh, my high school English professor at the time had recommended that I read this book. Mm. Um, and little did I know how much I would change even just within a period of 12 months. I think that book affected me adversely in terms of, you know, the ideas that it was posing to me about secondhand people, you know, just like if, if you are truly original and individualistic and creative is when you'll thrive in a meritocratic society and, um, well, socialism and like communism is, but it, it had very pro-capitalistic ideals. And um, I, I also somehow ended up being indoctrinated with the same values. I remember I would argue with uh, um, my economics professor at the time in, in high school about why like people without homes don't deserve to partake in like tax credits or societal uh, resources because I was like, if you are not doing anything for society, you don't deserve to have your share. And I can't believe how much I've evolved since then. I, I do um, re attribute a lot of my, both my deterioration and growth and growth to that book. Um, I think it made me question a lot of, or like challenge a lot of constructs that I had in my own head about how society should work. I think those were questions too big for me to contemplate at the age of 15 I feel like I should have like lived life a little bit more and interacted with more people so yeah definitely when it comes to books that you read again that's one that I stay away from because like and the irony of it all is I will show you my background but um I've actually I found a big <laughs> off the fountainhead to just like uh, I was shopping like i think it's like second hand like thrift shopping and i found it lying somewhere and i just like picked it up and framed it up as a reminder of the a, a one book that has um shaped my path in life but um i think the old man in the sea comes close because that book to me is about perseverance and determination and sort of uh, you know even if you're alone in your struggle you're succeeding against all odds then um, I feel like that's it's a beautiful parable to kind of uh, latch on to with you know just the old man in the sea and and the fish that he is trying to sort of kill or yeah. capture or you know I guess overpower yeah um, um, and the fish could stand in for so many things in life right like in our own personal struggles so I'm glad that the book resonated with you yeah and it's interesting what what we take from a book you know because um it's nice that they, in that particular book, the author didn't really tell you what the sea stood for or what the fish stood for or whatever the challenges stood for. You can make your own meaning from it, you know. And when you told me about the Fountainhead poster, I was thinking about these, you know, I was recently watching these architectural digest videos where they give you a glimpse of people's houses. And it's so, it's so intriguing to see um, the thinking behind certain decisions uh, with regards to the interior decor of a person's house, even if it's just a rented space, what do we choose to put up on the walls? And what does that tell you about us as individuals? So, you know, like thinking about your house, what are some things we would find around Shivani's house in terms of like, because like an interesting story, I remember going to a friend's house in Guwahati and uh, he told me that his dad would always collect a little artifact from every place they would visit. So they had like a whole shelf of all these little toys from, I don't know, from Australia or from another country. And I felt like that was such an interesting conversation starter. So we had like a long conversation about each artifact, like his dad was just telling us about each thing. So if we had to have a similar conversation in your house, Shivani, what would we see? Let me see, what are the conversation pieces in the house? Are we about to do an architectural digest, like 1.0? <laughs> I, I, I would know nothing about it. So, <laughs> um, But I do tend to, I'm thinking about the things that I put up on my walls and um, next to the two, next to the poster of the Fountainhead, there's just two pictures of uh, different scenes in New York. Um, and then I think... Um, there are a couple of poems that I have put up on that side uh, that have like 
chosen a nice little frame to put them up in uh, i can't seem to remember who the poet is but uh, there is this one poet who created a color series based on new york and uh, she uh, decided to label those colors based on things that she found in new york so like mm-hmm. the blue is the manhattan bridge blue and the orange is the f train orange and I think the purple is the bodega mops purple and then she has a very short sort of photo pylon poem that kind of encapsulates her feeling towards that color and i like sort of sprinkling that throughout the house i think if there was one thing that's a central theme that ties together anything put up on my walls is my love for the city and brooklyn specifically i, I think ever since i moved to brooklyn in 2017 Uh, after right after grad school it's been my constant i don't ever want to go back to manhattan like you know there's like you know there's five boroughs and there's queens and bronx and staten island and manhattan and brooklyn and i think there's something about this place that really enriches my soul like i feel like i'm all constantly surrounded by inspiration but not necessarily by the busyness of manhattan where people um you know take strolls in the neighborhood and talk to each other and like there is a an emphasis on community and i think that's the thing that i like about the city and i want to mm-hmm. kind of like capture that somehow and put it up everywhere just to remind me that this big bustling like violent city that everyone speaks of actually has very gentle corners and like um a nice little sort of layer to it that people often ignore and then like right behind me there's pictures from my childhood and Um, I have friends that I've taken sort of polaroid photos with over the years and yeah. so you know, little moments so yeah I try to keep it all close to me um and I think just for showing off sake I have a fireplace directly in my background so every time I get on my corporate calls and they're like oh, is that an active fireplace I'm like yes it is <laughs> you can tell them stories about how you use it every day in the point chat with like I still be... haven't turned it on. It's been like one month, and I still haven't. I don't know how to work the fireplace, but we'll figure it out. Call it a time. I know I have the same story actually like in my house I have like a bar table and like bar stools like six bar stools and I have no clue why because uh, it was actually like a furnished like space when I moved in and I have a feeling yeah <laughs> I don't know what the landlord was thinking I hope he doesn't listen to this but that's <laughs> bathrooms there are there are like so many bar stools around the house i i wonder what 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 used to happen here before i moved in here but yeah that's like another story but thinking about like new york as a city i i am just so fascinated by the space i think i've been there about because my sister stays there i think i mentioned this to you last time and whenever i'm there i think i was last there in 2019 in uh, december and i know that museums have this thing where one day in the week they have like um, like free admission right so yeah. i made this itinerary for that whole week where um and it's interesting that they go on different days of the week as well like different weekdays so uh, i decided to go to a different museum every day and the whole week was like free of cost because you think the and you planned it that way you are like the ideal New York trooper. This is what I always envision doing like even just like walking down Museum Mile. I think it's what's it called? Is it just called Museum Day? But I do know they give you a free access sort of pass. Yeah. Like on Fridays with me is like pay as you wish. I think the the Met has one day too or and then there were a couple of random museums that I also went to. I I know there is there's one that I thought was a museum but it wasn't a museum. The the Greenwood Cemetery. I oh, uh, you made it up there. I love that place. I love I I so enjoyed the Greenwood Cemetery because it's so cool that they give you the little brochure yeah. and they tell you to like do a little tour. <laughs> it was actually me and my sister we were just walking around and then it started getting dark <laughs> and then we realized we don't want to be here and uh, and it's really really big, right? I think that is such a unique. I mean I would not want to miss visiting a place like that and that would like be the first thing on my list in terms of like a place I really want to visit like like what are some places you really enjoy revisiting in New York There's a uh, usually um well ironically stores are not like 
actual places of learning that I sometimes go back to. I like the Strand by Union Square. It's like a really nice bookstore. Um, mm-hmm. Got all of these different zones. I don't come back to it too often, but every time somebody visits New York, I'm like, you know, skip all the touristy stuff. Let's go to. Well, the Strand is kind of a touristy bookshop, but it's it's nice to just visit a bookstore in each neighborhood to see even the shelf display changes, right? Like even the choice of books on the tables changes. There's green light in Fort Greene. There's um, uh, Books Are Magic. It's the name of a store in Cobble Hill. Mm -hmm. And that also happens to be like one of my favorite stores. Curiously, I walk in and I don't really buy anything. I just look at the cover and like I'll order it online. I know. I I feel so (laughs) bad. But I... I know and I completely you know uh, know where that's coming from and I honestly do you know be more conscious I'm more conscious about setting aside a budget to actually buy you know books from a physical like uh, like bookstore that is actually independently run and I think it's so important to support those stores and uh, yeah because it's it's just the the intimacy of having a conversation with the bookseller about um, why they would recommend a particular book and what you are thinking, right? I think you're not just paying for the book, but you're paying for the experience of being among so many books, you know, which I don't think the digital space would uh, be able to give you in the same measure, right? I know. I think your brain starts working in a whole different way because when you see all those titles and ideas in one space, it kind of gives you, you know, coming a little bit to how I fell into my current profession too. It gives you a sense of the zeitgeist. It gives you a sense of what people are thinking about or feeling in the current moment. If you see the self help section like very a lot very padded up with lots of displays and um you take a closer look at the titles and they're all about, you know, because I think uh, how not to give a fuck was it? Was that the name of the book? Um when that started trending and it was on every bookshelf in the um, self-help section, you really start to wonder about what the prevailing sentiment is towards, um, you know, harboring healthy relationships with other people. I think at one point, how not to give a fuck would not have been the motto. Yeah. And how to give a fuck. But yeah. uh, uh, I think walking into bookstores like that and then, reading specific like staff recommendations i think books are magic does a great job they all have handwritten notes next to each book about like you know coming from specific employees they have a newsletter as well to send it to you like after the fact because they change them every month and it's i'm sure every bookstore does this but the way they do it is uh, very um, sweet and personal and you feel like you're a part of this universe so um and like, you know, the books that they put up or the books that they arrange, I'm sure some of it is strategic because they want to, They either they've been like paid by the publisher to prop it up or like, you know, highlight certain titles, but it always does give you a sense for uh, the zeitgeist, what people are thinking. Uh, yeah. And yeah. And I, I love that little bit in your website, Fanny, where you, I think it's like a little changing visual about how, um, you mentioned um, our choice in brands tell us something about you know who we are, our choice in memes, our choice in ice cream. And it was really cool how you designed that visual. I think it's right about your bio on your website, but that's so true, you know, and we often don't think about it. And, you know, like what kinds of movies do we like to watch? What kind of TV shows do we like to watch? And it's really interesting, even when you are meeting someone uh, for the first time, like once you get past the conversations about work and, you know, general background stuff, you're often talking about, so what are you watching these days? What are you reading these days? And I wonder why uh, we often tend to move towards that line of questioning. Is it because we want to find someone that has um, our, our same vision of the world? Or why do you think we do that? Very interesting question. I, I wonder what the agenda is for everyone. Everyone asks that question and I'm sure everyone has a different agenda or different intention in asking it because maybe someone is trying to look at what new shows that are out there that they should catch up on or someone's uh, trying to read the person and yeah. trying to be like, oh, I want to get a sense for um, the kind of content 
you relate to because uh, the way you emotionally identify with or connect with the piece tells somebody else a lot about who you are as a person and I feel like I think high I don't know why I pointed at myself when I said highly emotionally intelligent people <laughs> <laughs> but I, I mean I like to think that I'm a good people reader and um, that's usually a go-to question is uh, what are you watching these days so that's usually my intention behind asking is like I want to get a sense for what you like even in terms of sense of humor or um, you know if it's like uh, crime shows or if it's uh, um, thrillers or you know nowadays we watch all sorts of things I think they, they span genres and people don't like to restrict them to one but um, even if they're watching something that's trending like mm-hmm. they're watching Succession because everybody else is talking about it or they're watching something that's more niche and obscure and something nobody else knows about because they like to sort of nourish their own um, interests so yeah I think like either way it tells you a lot about somebody and maybe there's also like a third category you know somebody who's just asking the other person what shows they're watching to find some common ground and to be like okay yeah let's talk about this show what do you think of the characters in it and you know how do you relate because I want to find an icebreaker so it works this question is a good question for <laughs> I guess like it's a versatile question to use in any social setting yeah yeah I think yeah, and I think different people have different answers to that sort of um, question too, right? And I, yeah, it's just very interesting to think about why we make certain decisions and how we would not associate with those decisions maybe five or six years down the line. But, you know, just thinking about your passion for books and going really back in the day, you know, like your, because I know you went to a boarding school, right, Shmani? And, and it was, um, I think it was in Maharashtra. And, and were you, uh, are you Maharashtran, Shwani? I am, yeah. So I'm, I'm uh, part Maharashtra. My mom is Punjabi and my dad is Marathi. And Got it. Uh, we, I went to boarding school in Pune. So. Awesome. What was that, I mean, what was that experience like for you? Because I, even, I mean, I grew up reading books about children in boarding schools and the adventures they went on. I wonder if it was the same for you. Was it the naughtiest girl in school? The- in it, I did, it could it could be it i probably was annette blyton and and actually i really liked annette blyton for the way she described food was she the person that wrote the famous five series yes yeah. yes and, oh and secret seven if i'm not wrong yes i mean the way they described food in that book that was the only thing i looked forward to they had such you know lavish breakfast spreads and i was like wow that's <laughs> interesting i hadn't thought about the way she describes food maybe that deserves its own paper maybe somebody should write a high school paper on and it blight in books and the way uh, yeah <laughs> maybe, I, I mean i don't want to speculate but maybe she has a tenuous relationship with food and it might be interesting to look into her life as an author but um uh yeah it, the the cakes and the naughtiest girl in school were also very lavishly described it's like you know the big chocolate cake like on the table that everybody would there would always be a tuck shop or yeah uh, some sort of like i guess it, it, it was very british right so um, I would say a lot of the things that i read about boarding school and books didn't immediately like, directly translate to my boarding school experience in pune but yes that would be uh, what we called a refectory or a, a canteen where everybody gathers for specific times of the day for meals there would be four meals breakfast lunch snack dinner um and um, there would be designated times for exercise 6 6 a.m yoga wow. <laughs> every day uh, and would you turn up for those sessions every single day well i was head girl so i had to break everybody up for those sessions and be there on time oh, gosh, okay. <laughs> i think it just uh, it really did, I think, become a part of my software, so to speak, to just be an early riser. Except for today, for some reason, I decided to sleep in till age seventeen, and I was like, "Oh my god, I have a call with Abhishek in three minutes." <laughs> it's fine. Uh, we were we were on the same page about that, so you're good. You're so. Highly ambitious about being productive on Sunday. Yeah. But, um, yeah, I think boarding school mainly. Uh, when it when it comes to books, it it did cultivate a love for reading. I had some great English teachers. I think everybody um, will have, anybody who's interested in um, 
the English language or like mm-hmm. passionate about the language always has one teacher they had in their lives that they cherish. Um, sure. They might have shared a very um, deep, intimate relationship with this teacher in terms of like, you know, learning a lot about the world. It, I don't know if this is true for um, second language learners, first language learners, native speakers, but it's probably to do with my Indian identity as somebody who grew up speaking mainly Hindi and Marathi and like English was slowly sort of like included into my school diet um, at an early age. It, it was still a foreign language to me and to discover so many like literary devices and um, the ways you would craft language to have an effect on people. It's, it's something that I didn't think was possible for me to do. I, like, I, I would just read a lot. I didn't think that I would be on the other side of the book, you know, and uh, crafting those phrases. So I think it, it was my sort of little aspiration to be a writer started off early, but it was only when I moved to boarding school when I was, I think, 12. Mm-hmm. Parents said that poor only child to boarding school at the age of 12. No, I'm kidding. Um, they... They really wanted to me to uh, cultivate values of independence mm-hmm. and self-sufficiency and um, being like disciplined. My dad comes from um, an Air Force background, so okay. you know, there there were just there was a, a, an emphasis and value placed on uh, structures sure. and like how to thrive within a productive environment, how to create one for yourself. And they always wanted me to do well and probably even just um yeah i think like find my footing on my own and i think like it's it's equipped me for like you know it's been what um how many years six five six years since you've been away from home Te- yeah technically but it feels like i've been away from home since i was 12 right like it yeah. feels like i've been away for 14 or 15 years and it's give me maybe like those additional years of prep to be okay with um, sort of finding and building a life on my own. And I always have their backs for support. And, yeah. um, you know, as, as a support system and as for even just like moral backing, I, I always have their good wishes. But um, it's, been, it's been a less than rough journey only because I think that I have had the opportunity to go to boarding school because I, I think I've also witnessed a lot of my peers or well, not a lot, like a few of my peers kind of struggle with that. Mm-hmm. Like with maybe being comfortable in your own space and sure. by yourself and getting things done. And it's, it's, it's not necessarily a trait that everyone aspires to. I think some people would say um, too much independence like creates distance between you and um, the friends and family that you grew up with and who care about you and Mm -hmm. too much self-sufficiency might uh, create rifts and uh, misunderstandings and miscommunications. So it's definitely a delicate balance, but I think um, going to school and learning how to uh, cope and kind of live on my own has Mm -hmm. prepared me. That's what I would attribute boarding school to. And, yeah. and the books, the books always helped. <laughs> yeah, because they, I mean, it does emotionally prepare you for, um, you know, any sort of experience. I think it, it also adds to that layer of being an immigrant and, you know, being on your own for a while. And I think, um, especially for students that move out of their homes, um, because I know you moved to Mumbai where you were on your own for a while and then you moved to another country, which is New York and like uh, the US. So I'm, I'm just imagining that, that sort of early experience of being on your own probably prepped you for these environments and maybe helped you in some way before you actually were. And I think like fiction does that. Sometimes when I read fiction, when you read the emotional experience of another character, it almost preps you for something similar that you may go through. And I, I feel like that is one of the selfish reasons I read fiction is because I want to gather as many emotional experiences as possible. It's really cool that you can, for some time, read the experience of a 50-year-old person, completely imbibe that person's worldview, and live through that person's life experience. And then once you're out of the movie, or out of the TV show, or out of the book, you're suddenly back in your own world. And you can translate that uh, sort of view of the world 
and for some time you actually feel like you are the character that is in that you know show or book sorry one moment my name is going to i just realized my yeah and i think that is one of the selfish reasons i possibly read fiction and i don't know if it's the same for you but like i'm just thinking about um like what was it like for you at not only the school but then um at uh, the the mass media college and then you know the school of visual arts you were in three very different learning environments that had different expectations of you were there some professors or courses that stand out to you as courses that really define your thinking and leading you onto this path of you know uh, becoming a cultural strategist or taking up branding as a profession because i feel like some of those early academic experiences really set up the foundation so if you had to give me like two or three classes or professors or even books that really stood out for you in that period of learning what were they for you mm. yeah it's it's um not the books or the courses but the interactions with people and learning about the backgrounds i think that provided me with an inkling of what i should be doing next mm. and um with mass media i think it's safe to say if you're going to school to study mass media there's not a lot of studying you're going to be doing like <laughs> there is um a lot of maybe um attending uh, college festivals like you know meeting new people seeing what they're up to because a lot of people in that particular course start working way earlier on like they start you know signing major projects at the age of 19 and 20 and as filmmakers and music producers and um i think that sort of uh, aspirational leaning inspired me um to be attending college festivals where people would for fashion shows create costumes from scratch using the material that they had and being really nimble and um scrappy with um the way they would create things was yep. i guess now that i'm thinking about it this is i think it's the way you asked me that question that's um prompting me to think about it through that lens but yeah i think the the power to create was really strong in that course and it was inspiring to be friends with and spend all my time with these uh, types of personalities and then um when it came to picking branding as my choice of study in grad school i think it it, it does go back to my i guess current statement on my website about our choices in brands reflecting our uh, i guess resolve or personality even as as human beings i think it sure. says, reflects who we are as human beings it says something about us um mainly because i'm going back to the original learning environment in boarding school yeah. there was um, a visual arts class that we all had to take um and i was new i think I mean, this was when i was 12 in 7th grade and the uh i i happened to be good at drawing and um, all the students would come to me and sort of like give me their notebooks or like their art books to do the assignment and then <laughs> would so my own and it was a nice way to i guess make friends because i was like oh wow i guess i could use my drawing ability to now be friends with other people except there was this one assignment where we had to draw brand logos and uh coming from the background that i come from i i it's uh, well i like low middle class i bell i didn't even know how to pronounce levis i didn't know what the logo of clothes la- clothes rack looked like so when they would sort of list all these these students came to me as usual and they were like let's draw this logo let's draw that logo and you can imagine i'm i'm going to boarding school with these kind of like privileged kids right like they come from well to do families mm-hmm. and um i think that really there was like a deep seated insecurity that started back then i was like wow i don't know anything about these brands and i think the only way i can fit in is to change the way i dress is to um look at what the new thing is that my friends might be into or like my potential friends might be into i think i even picked up a book how to be popular by mike cabot <laughs> <laughs> just to <laughs> somehow find my way into those inner circles yeah and i think that really was the original sort of seed of why i took up branding without knowing it consciously or unconsciously 
maybe it's like marrying my uh, ability to find kind of like the most influential powerful person in the room and like right. trying to see how i can fit in or like how i can try to have some power because i didn't i grew up always like on the edges of bullying or whatever like as, as, as the target of i guess certainly um lack of kindness but i think that really did push that ability to identify the most powerful person or like how to be a part of like inner circles and i felt like that skill marries very well with the interest in branding because i mm-hmm. think branding is about creating exclusive images and um groups of belonging where you try to make a, a brand is i think like it's it's more definitely more than a logo and definitely more than a verbal or visual identity i think it's like a feeling that everyone agrees to be a part of or like agrees to participate in in some sure. and um branding to me has always been the practice of creating exclusive uh sets of uh, followers i guess thing with and and i then in in on that way i would consider uh, uh christianity like a practice in branding yeah. and yeah. you could really then apply that to anything really and not just corporate uh, entities so yeah even even that, political ideologies historical movements can come in the same bracket as branding exercises right in in scary and like um other not so scary ways exactly yeah in fact um during the branding course we had somebody come in who had uh, designed the hope poster for uh, obama's campaign in 2008 and um in how they also just came up with the entire identity how the o was very specifically designed and how much of an impact that had from wow. both like a visual and emotional perspective and um there's like you said there's this both sides of that is like one in which you um create entire movements and help people feel ownership over the cause that you have created through a logo like through a visual identity yeah. and then there's also the other side the manipulative side where the um impact is much more uh insidious and you don't really know how you're being affected and as i think branding professionals as advertising professionals as well we learned a little bit of this in the mass media program yeah. is you need to be aware of um tools of propaganda and how it is in your power to use them and build them the way you want and um, you should be uh, aware of that responsibility so yeah it's i mean it's so it's so fascinating to listen to you shivani because i was immersed in this growing up my dad was like an advertising professional he had like a little advertising company but we mainly specialized in print ads and my sister is now a communication designer so she was the uh the the person that would spend a lot of time in my dad's shop and now she's doing it in her own different way so yeah, a lot of our it's stones throw away from my apartment <laughs> It is. Yeah, she it's such a such a weird coincidence. She actually stays around. I mean, she studied at that university that's really close to your house, but thinking about branding, Shivani, like like just to do like a random exercise okay? and you probably put a lot of thought into this. I'm just going to randomly shout out the names of some brands and you've got to tell me uh the first thing that comes to your mind when I say this brand. It could be an emotion, it could be a color, it could be Yeah. Yeah. So um nike determination i uh, guess because of the just do it but recently they took a pivot with that play new campaign where they are emphasizing mental health more and they are like you know what if you don't feel like doing it don't do it like that's the that's the pivot that they've taken and just i think i've gotten down the wrong hole shivani i'm <laughs> i'm talking about brands or a brand expert so i feel like i'm going to get a lot more detail and which is good which is what i was looking at it would be like, as rapid as you i know <laughs> this was going to be one of those quick rapid fires but i don't think so but it's good what about um starbucks mom and i think it goes back to the third the starbucks was one of the first oh my god i'm adding context to every answer please don't which is good which is which is something i would not understand i mean i would not be able like when i think of starbucks the first thing that comes to my mind is coffee 
right? But mm-hmm. to you, you, I think, associate a notion. And in my mind, I know that when I think about Starbucks, I can make coffee at home. Why do I want to go to Starbucks? It's just really nice to be in a coffee shop around people. And then subconsciously, I know that there is a feeling of warmth associated with it. But I feel like as a branding professional, you are able to immediately identify that. And I think as a consumer, that's where I'm coming into this conversation. As a consumer, I think like coffee and even Nike, for me, it's shoes, which is weird, right? And your your association is determination. And then you had, so you probably understand what their branding strategy is, you know, and that that's pretty intriguing to see. What about like, let me just see, let me try doing something that isn't as... Um, India. Oof. Yeah, I still think of India as home. Like oh. I, I just yeah, that's the word that comes to my mind. But I do immediately think of food and like the colors. It's it's almost like it's a just a flash of a violent sort of like collage of all these things like yeah. and dance and there's food and colors and it's it's a little bit like. Um, I have an Adarsh Balak poster also hanging up on my wall, oh, okay. <laughs> which is something ironically I picked up from Austin in Texas. Okay. And it's the colors. I don't know if you remember the charts that we would buy from like the stationery store to teach us about values and like Adarsh Balak was one of them. And the colors that they use, I think those are the colors that come to mind. They're very like sprightly, like yellows and reds and yeah. Blue. And all the figures are very pronounced, right? Like they all look like tiny adults. So, <laughs> so I think that's what comes to mind when I think of India. Wow. What about what about New York though? If it's home for India, what would you say for New York now? Is that? I think an image again springs to mind. I think it's the um, stoops, like the you know the brownstone buildings that line the block and I think of like the stoops I don't know why I, I, I think of that image but maybe what I'm uh, associating New York with is just neighbors and community which is odd because that's not what New York City's association would be for a lot of people but um, yeah I think of like neighbors or just like walking down the sidewalk and mm-hmm. meeting somebody so, I like to be out and about for sure like I like walking around I barely spend any time in the apartment yeah, I think that's actually a very great way to see or understand a city. And just and I think New York's a very good walking city. I mean, it could be a lot better in terms of like the pavements and sidewalks being a little more well done in like all the boroughs, you know, like not just the fancy parts of Manhattan and Brooklyn. But I feel like if there was actually a book, you probably know about this, like a walking history of New York or something where... I don't think I've read it, but I would love to pick it up. So the person actually, you made really, really, let me just send this to you. This was like one of the books that I came across in one of these random walks across New York, where the person decided to walk across each borough or each uh, sort of area of New York. And he wrote like a little history of the places that he saw. And this reminded me so much of the project that, you know, you also so did where you looked at the the vital signs around different neighborhoods during uh, the COVID pandemic. And let me just send that to you, Shivani. I think you would really, really enjoy that particular I sort of... It. Yeah. yeah. And if there was maybe an audio version of that where I could listen to it as I'm walking around, it would be... I, yeah, I, I think there is. And honestly, I actually got the book from one of these staff recommendation lists at uh, maybe a bookstore in Bro- at a bookstore in Brooklyn because it, I'm pretty sure it isn't on any best-selling list. It's just like a book that the person wrote out of the passion of and his, and his love for the city, you know? So it was just interesting to see where that came from. And I would love to see something similar for Bombay or, you know, like the other, like Mumbai or the other big cities around the world. But what about your sense of home, Shirani? Like, do you feel like, because you've moved from different places and you also went to a boarding school and then you were in Mumbai and New York, and these are all such great, like, happening cities. Like, if I had to tell you what is home to you right now, like, what would immediately come to your mind? Uh, and do you mean home in terms of place or like, um, you know, are you asking sort of for associations or, I, or 
I would say like a sense of, uh, let, let me just see what your association is with the word home and then take it from there. Yeah. Because I, I struggle with this sort of question I a lot. With it too. I know, and for, for me, it's, it's even more confusing because I never even grew up in India. I grew up in the Middle East. And then I was in India for like a little block of six or seven years. And then I got transported to another country. So I, I, I am so like confused about like that identity. But I also understand that um, for me personally, just to like share my reflection, that the idea of home isn't associated with a place. It's uh, for me, it's associated with the people and uh, the things that I am engaged with in that particular, particular environment. For instance, Mississauga, the place that I stay in right now, or I think it, it's given me a sense of home because of the work I do here and a couple of the activities that I, you know, really associate with. But Bahrain, the place I grew up in, like, uh, I, don't, I don't have too many friends there right now. So if I go there right now, even though I spent 18 years of my life there, I feel like I would not have a very strong connection even though Bahrain should technically be home, you know? So, like, what, like, in that sense, what would your, like, if you had to call a place home right now, where would that be? It would be Brooklyn, yeah. Awesome. I think it would be. By those definitions, yes. But I will say I have met a couple of, I guess, New York transplants that also don't have a sense of home. I, a conversation with, a friend is coming back to me. He, he in fact, also grew up in Bahrain. He was oh. born in Bahrain. Oh. Uh, he moved to Canada at the age of 10. So he has spent some time in Toronto. Okay. But um, his mom is on the west side near Vancouver. And she, well, she is the only, uh, like, real sort of family member he has but she happens to be on the other side of the border. And when I asked him, you know, what, what's home to you? He said, home is where my mom is. And oh. like, wherever she goes is home. Yeah. And, um, you know, as somebody who, have, who was raised by a single mother, um, having trans, like, traveled from Bahrain to Canada to, like, you know, different parts of Canada to now come to New York is... Maybe your idea is of home is never really rooted in the place where you grow up because that's always transitory and it, everything feels so ephemeral. So yeah, you, I, I agree with you. I think home can often be tied to the people you spend most time with and that, that person becomes your idea of home. Yeah, yeah. Because I... Very precarious like of an idea to hold on to because people will always come and go. Yeah, yeah. That's the heartbreaking thing about New York too is you'll make so many friends and you can never assume that they'll stay here forever um, yeah. because not everybody has the same attachment to the city I knew that I would be around for a long time but I have met and made friends with so many people who I shared a deep connection with and who would just maybe leave within a span of one or two years so you always got to be on your toes and keep finding your new I guess uh, nuggets of home yeah, <laughs> yeah. You've but I, I, you know, like it's so, it's it's intriguing to think about that question too, because like sometimes it's people, but sometimes you also realize it's like your sense of some sort of stability in your life, you know, because if you think about high school and university, you know, you know, you're going to move out of that phase at a certain point. And for some reason, those relationships also become relationships that you have for that period in your life. But then once you start working, there is the, the possibility that you may be in a space for a little longer than, than you know, uh, when you, so I don't know, there's just, I feel like I feel most at home now, even though I have none of my family members with me or none of my, you know, and, and I'm an immigrant, you know, so there's that other additional layer of like, I, it's, it's interesting that I still feel the sense of home right now in more ways than I ever felt before in my life. And I think it, it's different for different people, but I, I completely relate to your uh, sense of not also tying that only to the people, but also to uh, a sense of your 
your comfort in those relationships too because in any relationship i think you bring something to the table right and i feel like there can be a sense of home and what you bring to that relationship and i was actually you know we put so much thought into um planning evenings or dates you know or things with our friends what if we could put the same thought into you know maybe just doing it with ourselves like and i recently started doing this i was like so you know i have a weekend to myself i'm not really meeting anyone why don't i plan a fun date with myself and then i made a list of like all the things i love doing yeah. and i just i just went ahead and did all of those things like with myself and i i saw a movie on my own and all i and and it's something that a lot of people don't enjoy doing so like yeah. you went for a movie on your own and and i really really enjoyed it and you know i didn't have to explain anything to anyone like you know like are you okay are you are you feeling bored do you still want to do this you know do you want to move to something else or but i could just keep doing it and uh, you know like i i enjoy reading in coffee shops and so yeah just that it, yeah no go it, ahead good it's that you know quality time that you spend with yourself um uh, I was just talking about this yesterday with a friend uh, in school you would have summer vacations sort of designated as the part of your school year to take a break to step away from everything and give yourself some time like explore play um, hang out with your friends uh, catch up on some reading if you have to is whatever you want it to be and then slowly as the school years fall away the academic years fall away with their whole like structure and discipline as adults growing adults you forget that you were supposed to build in a summer vacation for yourself yeah. and like it doesn't have to last 3 months but i mean for it it could even last 6 if you wanted to and um it's that time is so important for your development and like for uh, to help you sort of look inwards and understand what is it that you like right and i remember it was in late 2019 when i took my first solo trip they despite all of these sort of years of i guess staying and living independently i, w- I would always have roommates i would always have people around but um i never thought of going on a trip by my, on my own and the first place that i chose to go to was vancouver in like canada so i i flew there and then i took a trip to seattle i like took the train down and every day felt um like precious because every meal you could like decide on your own where you wanted to go to you could design your day the way you wanted to and that's a, a freedom that like i think a lot of people should maybe learn to cherish and you know it, it doesn't always have to be you don't have to always have someone to you know i mean it all it, yeah i think you slowly start finding i think as you move through your 20s you know like both of us are in our late like early late 20s i think mid late 20s but i think you slowly start hopefully finding a sense of home in yourself you know like like nobody is going to give you a vacation like nobody is going to ask you to take a break and to step away and me you, i mean that's when you have to sort of learn to advocate for yourself and sure. when you feel like your engine is stuttering or when you feel like you're on the edge of burnout it, there is nobody else who will listen because on the outside everything looks fine so yeah yeah very important to take those breaks and like pay attention to yourself for sure no i i completely agree just to uh, shivani just to be mindful of time you know can we just do 10 more minutes because i don't want to keep you waiting is that okay yeah that's, that's perfectly fine yeah because i just want to because i know you have another appointment right after this and i don't want to that's know, okay keep... i need only 30 minutes to get there i will shower quickly and it's it's all good awesome. i like, want to you know, i want to have this conversation i'm i'm really immersed so yeah so, yeah i i mean there's so much i this was not what i planned at all this is but i i feel like at the end of the day you know this was just because i think we just went where you know it had to go and i like but i'm i'm really like curious about your profession shrani you know like i i teach uh, like elementary students in a school and we often talk about professions to them and you know off the top of my head i talk to them about what it means to be a doctor what it means to be a lawyer but if i had to tell them what a cultural strategist does on a day to day basis and really sell the career to them you know like they're like i can do anything now so 
And I think it would be a really fun thing for them to do. Like, how would, what would a day in your life look like in terms of like an ideal work day that had, doesn't have all the other variables with the pandemic and other stuff involved. So. An ideal work day would mean a lot of reading, talking to people and writing. Okay. So that's those are those three simple ingredients you need to thrive in the profession. I think, um, the ability to put yourself into like deep focus at the drop of a hat on command is important. Um, So being a cultural strategist, I am now um, a senior manager of cultural intelligence uh, at Viacom CDS and the team of, I think, it's like 30 to 35 and we are grouped into smaller teams of uh, five to six. And within those teams, we have our calendars for the year. The the main project goals that we work towards is releasing reports. We work on a lot of intelligence reports that are audience driven the research is very audience driven you're constantly thinking about what people are talking about what they're sharing as it relates to media and entertainment because this is why com cds so um when it comes to the daily sort of uh keeping in touch with culture like you would wake up and i, I read every day three newsletters to start my day and then um click on like all the articles that I'd bookmarked from the day before to sort of read through and then like capture quotes and lines that feed into certain reports that we're doing as they're relevant and, um, you know, managing projects. So uh, making sure everything's running smoothly, like talking to the people who, so for example, if my coordinator is working on um, research that relates to love and relationships, for example, that happens to be an area that we're exploring right now. Um, she would have maybe watched a reality show or she may have uh, worked on a survey that she wants to distribute amongst like a a sample that we decided on. So we will go over that. I think, um, and then in the end, the writing part is really the ones that I set out, set aside entire days to. It's something that, you know, it's, it's the time of day where you don't really want to be disturbed by anybody. Mm -hmm. But because of the pandemic, uh, in an open office sort of like plan, I would sit at my desk, have my headphones on. My headphones were my way of telling everybody not to <laughs> not to encroach upon my personal space. But um, in the pandemic, it's become increasingly harder, um, believe it or not. But yes, you spend all that time alone. But as you open up a Google Doc, like you have Slack notifications coming in, you have emails to address. Um, a lot of them are time sensitive and... Um, in a collaborative doc, you always happen to have at least one or two other people in the same doc, right? Like yeah. they, it's their way of being kind of like in a conference room with you. So even when you get a writing assignment, at any given point, you feel like you're being watched <laughs> or you feel like somebody is watching you write these words. So you, you have this need to be efficient. Um, and I think that really does take a toll on creativity we are like finding ways to curb that so that you do get sort of your own space right own space to because as a writer and i didn't know this i thought this was just a unique issue um when i struggle with sentences i open up the thesaurus or like i look up sentence usage structures or i uh, will sort of go off on a tangent and look into this thing that i want to learn about to sort of carry over words that i'm using there to this other space so everyone has their own unique process and yeah. um it it doesn't matter how you get there as long as you get there and sure. for the longest time i didn't understand how to do that as a writer to ask for the tools you need whether it's a, a doc all to yourself or the time that you need to write something and um yeah so i would say as a cultural strategist the two main skills you need are to observe patterns, to recognize patterns as they're happening across categories. So even just like the small example of thinking Nike translates to determination and then determination as an idea can be found in self-help books or sure. like in um, songs or sure. in dance. Bringing, create, bringing all those things together is part of like one bucket of 
uh, ideas or concepts is is like an example of how you practice pattern recognition and the second is articulation so mm -hmm. to be exposed to all these different diverse stimuli in terms of study material it could be videos that you're watching articles that you're looking at um, at academic papers that you're pouring over and you're supposed to take all of that as clay to sort of mold into uh, a report uh, to sort of um, analyze what you're observing so sure. i think observation and analysis are really the two simple skills you need and your sort of ability to take in lots of information at all times i i al always think of myself as a channel i think of myself as a it's yeah. so funny. It's not a sponge, but a channel. Yeah. Like I have to, I can't be a sponge. If I am a sponge, I will explode. <laughs> when, when you said channel, I felt like you were, you know, stimulating like energies. And stuff. But in a way, you are doing that. I, and, that's, and that's exactly what I meant. Yeah. Time relates. It's all to sound so wacky, but I think of myself as a spiritual channel. It's like, like kind of like a funnel where I am taking a lot of information and knowing what to sift through. To yeah. Like uh, sort of, so that when it comes out the other end, it's cohesive and comprehensible. Sure. So, um, yeah, yeah, I don't want to add too much of a, a divine layer to what I'm doing. No, <laughs> no, but I think you you actually really beautifully articulated like what um, it comes down to, right? Those basic ideas of observing patterns and articulating it in the most engaging, um, relatable way possible. I feel would be a very uh, simple, straightforward way to explain that to, you know, a young person thinking about these professions. And I think that's, it's really nice that, because, I mean, a lot of young people these days are creating their own jobs. You know, you don't really have to stick to those silos of, like we grew up in a time, at least because we grew up in like schools in, the, in India, you know, we had that sort of hierarchy of commerce, science and arts. And uh, there was this artificial, you know, sort of like pedestal given to the STEM subjects and then commerce was in the middle and then arts was at the end, right? And even if you were a really smart person that took the arts, they always looked down on you for some weird <laughs> reason. And I didn't, I never understood that distinction. And I feel like it's not as, you know, like that you don't really see that hierarchy as much, but you do see it in, you know, subconscious ways, even in immigration policy with the preference given to you know stem degrees and i think both of us probably feel the brunt of that you know in in so many different ways but i really like i think i was listening to again i'm going to be linking uh, shivani's website and the podcast that she hosts with uh, her friend ria and i'm <laughs> yeah i'm i'm a big fan of the podcast i listen to all the episodes i think in one of the episodes you and ria were talking about creating a separate email id to uh, consume newsletters and yeah. I thought that was a really cool idea because I look through my mailbox right now and whenever I get a normal mail, I'm like, oh my God, I got an email. That's, I'm so happy. Because From the, an actual human being. Wow. I know, because the only people that send me emails are like Starbucks or, you know, like big companies. And it's always my bank. My bank is like sending me emails about the most random nonsense ever. Like, oh, our bank got a new CEO. Our CEO went for a vacation. Oh my God, that is so important, and you need to know this. Being super ultra transparent about. That. I know, and it's like I can't, but I agree. I think you know, like category. Even though I think some programs or some like I use Gmail, and they have a way to divide it into primary, social. I think a lot of spam or like advertisement actually comes in like your primary sort of box too. But I think. There's so many things that we can diverge into, but just like the final question I want to ask you, Shivan, you know, because you are somebody that's put a lot of thought into like uh, the notion of, I mean, the idea of branding. Like if there was one brand campaign that, you know, really inspired you, I know there must be like so many and you can write like a whole piece on this, but like a recent brand campaign that you felt had something very human and creative about it that you, yeah. you would like to be part of. You know, or... Yeah, um, I think this is a, a little bit of what we cover in the final episode of Peas in a Pod, the podcast that um, Abhishek was talking about. Um, the uh, mental health advocacy that Naomi Osaka has pioneered sort of in the 
uh, athletic space was really inspiring to me. Um, it all happened so quickly, right? Like she was at the, I think, I believe it was the French Open. Mm-hmm. She uh, withdrew from press interactions. She was fined. Um, and I think it was the Calm app. So Headspace has a competitor Calm. Uh, they offered to cover the penalties uh, and the fines for Naomi Osaka during that time and extended uh, the penalty coverage to any other athlete who wanted to withdraw from press interaction. So um, a curious thing for an app to do, but I think um, to sort of make a statement on what that action represents and how uh, giving yourself time to meditate and spending more time on your mental health is uh, like, you know, an integral part of somebody's life. It should not be ignored. Is like a, a statement that they made with that extension of penalty coverage. So um, it's not really a campaign. Um, they just did it and it was covered in the news. But that to me is an impactful campaign and that the brand actually does something to either create or redefine existing standards um, mm. and set a tone for how other people should think or, um, you know, directly benefit the person that they have aligned with. So in this case, they did both, right? Like they helped Naomi Osaka and they also extended that to the athletic community. And um, I think that was an important move. Sweet Green, the salad chain, in I don't know if it's purely based in New York. I- I haven't heard about it, but... Sweet Green, I, I guess it's kind of like Dig In. I think Dig In might also be New York based. But they uh, are sort of like a buildable salad company. Um, and Sweet Green's main ambassador, even before the French Open happened, was Naomi Osaka. Okay. And uh, I think, you know, not an easy uh, piece of news to take as a brand. Like when your main ambassador happens to be sort of uh, in the news for quote unquote wrong reasons um, but they also took that within their stride and they stood by her and um, completely supported her actions and it wasn't a popular move for a major brand to take um, but it was received well and I think yeah it, it, just to sum it up actions that uh, make a, not just make a statement or like make an empty statement but actually uh have something actionable that they can get behind is is the standard to me yeah so it's yeah, it's it's i mean i would have expected you to you know tell me about like an advertising or marketing campaign it's so interesting that you spoke about something that the brand actually did and when you were speaking i almost thought about these brands as living entities that had a personality of their own and you know like if i had to design a human being for calm like what would that human being look like and i feel like that's what i thought about when you spoke about what mm-hmm. calm did to and i'm i think that's something we have in common to uh, shwani I, I love tennis i love watching tennis playing tennis and yeah. i think what naomi osaka did there and i think a lot of other sports people are actually coming out and speaking about this openly like i i also follow cricket there was a cricketer called ben stokes who took a whole year off in the middle of the year like you just said i don't want to play cricket i need to spend time with my family and i think it's nice that you have people that are so prominent in the media you know coming out and speaking so openly about mental health but yeah but yeah, it's a pattern recognition game yeah you seeing this popping up emerging in the sports space but you also are hearing about the great resignation you're hearing about people quitting their jobs um, with nothing lined up um with no safety net because they have decided to prioritize their own well-being right yeah. so it it feels like it's part of a larger sort of societal shift towards um like you know placing more emphasis on me and and in 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 with the end goal of eventually improving the we it's not mm-hmm. an entirely selfish move it is i think with the vision that if everybody took more care of themselves the world would be a kinder place sure. and that's what we need to work towards. So, um, yeah, it's it's funny how like even with like smaller cultural phenomena that emerges, it's it's easy to see what it ladders up to if you spend enough time in the profession. I guess. 
Yeah, and I think that's a it's a great note to you know end this conversation. I honestly feel like I can chat with you for so long about so many different things, and I didn't expect this conversation. I knew it would go in a, but I think we just it was it was a lot of fun, Shivani, and I I would really like to read more of your analysis, and that's something I would uh, encourage the listeners to do as well. Is don't just stop at this particular conversation. I will be linking Shivani's website and. the wonderful podcast uh, that she hosts where you will get to really know more about uh, a lot of her interests and and i think yeah i i i've learned a lot as a podcaster listening to you and ria shivani so thanks for doing that but please do look at shivani's website you can follow her on twitter and instagram i believe and uh, also uh, please please do hear the podcast uh, for the listeners thank you again for tuning in um, I will be coming up with uh, more episodes hopefully depending on how things open up and people schedules open up but Shivani thank you again for such a fun conversation and uh, yeah, it was a pleasure it was an honor it was everything i i really enjoyed our conversation thanks yeah, so much for initiating us yeah and uh, for the listeners until next time you know keep learning